Well, very cool. We've got some people coming in now, so let's get started. And as always, I want to invite you to create with me some sacred invitation energy. So we can call that an invocation, but whatever form works for you and whatever style works for you, I want you to bring that into the mix. And for me, it uh, is all about intentionality and taking a few moments to close our eyes and to take some deep cleansing breaths. And as we do that, let us focus this morning on what it is that we would we would want to receive. What it is that we would want to receive, not so much the, the specific thing, but what is the feeling? What is the feeling that we would like to welcome in? And as you gain a little bit of clarity around what that might be, also consider that that feeling or whatever that is, is already here. It is already in existence. And so what we are doing is we are removing all conscious or unconscious resistance to it. And we are saying, you are invited here, you are welcomed here. So if it's peace, if it's clarity, if it's comfort, if it's love, if it's connection, if, if it's guidance, whatever those things are that your heart is, is reaching for in this moment, to know that they are here and so our collective work this morning is to simply help each other eliminate and to remove any barriers to that. And as I speak for myself personally, I ask that any self-righteousness, any know-it-all uh, <laughs> energy from the ego that might be wafting around in my head, I just lay that on the altar of transfiguration and ask that it be dissolved so that the information that comes through, whatever it is that happens for us today in this transmission is so pure and, and so connected to the divine. We offer this time up together collectively knowing that where two or more energy systems are gathered together with intent, therefore, therefore the, the beautiful disruption occurs and in that disruption what is revealed is more light more beauty more god let it be so and so it is amen good beautiful oh and you know yolanda i'm so happy you keep joining us from south africa that's amazing and tom hello tom and Lori from toronto so good morning to you who it's an interesting process for me um, as I look at this time. There's a, a beautiful anticipation that occurs within because uh, I look at this little nugget of perhaps 30 minutes as an opportunity for, for something um, valuable to be laid down in terms of our human groundwork, not just for me, but for all of us. And uh, in the attempt to uh, get my bloated nothingness, as Ralph Waldo Emerson would say, out of the way, it's always a process that leads up to this because I think I know what I'm going to talk about, and then that gets kind of swept away. And so I try not to get try not to get too rigid and too planned with what is there, and to and to just move automatically into the spontaneity of that wisdom which is wanting to come through. And so this morning, um, what came to me was an old story uh, that I used to share about growing up. And in my postage stamp sized front yard, just a little tiny front yard in Southeast Texas, there was a mimosa tree. For those of us who are in the Southern states in the United States, uh, mimosa trees are fairly common. They are these spindly, beautiful, uh, wispy looking trees that when they bloom, they have these pink blossoms that are stringy. Uh, they can tend to be pretty messy, but they have this beautiful way of, if given free reign, to grow and then to umbrella, umbrella out. And it was a beautiful hiding place 
for me as a little boy to seek refuge and I would climb the mimosa tree. I would take books up there with me. Um, I used to talk about the fact that I would ride my little rusted bicycle to the, to the county library and had convinced them to let me check out uh, more than the allotment of books, and most of them were um, biographies of, of famous people that were written by uh, for, for young people. And I would bring those books, and I would climb up the tree, and I would read all of these stories, and I would lose myself in that space. And the reason why I would lose myself in that mimosa tree was because it felt safe. I had crafted a, a capsule of safety up there that was separate from my perceptions of the cruelty of the world, which existed below. And you still, still though, uh, logistically and, and functionally, you can't stay up in the tree. So there would be those moments where I would have to come down, which I always dreaded. And then as soon as I could, when when seasons permitted up back into the tree, I would go. And I think about that often. I think about that time growing up and the, and the harboring of safety that that mimosa tree provided for me. And the metaphor is not lost that many of us seek out our own mimosa tree. We, we want to climb this tree into this capsule of safety because it is there that we establish some sense of connection. It is there that there is a respite within our cautionary energy that is always uh, up for us as we navigate the human experience. It is there that we somehow seemingly drop our defenses and we can just be. And yet, one of, I'll call it a mistake, but one of the mistakes that we can make in the human experience is in wanting to stay in the tree. We actually go about busying ourselves in formulating a life that really energetically is about just staying in that capsule. It might be uh, trying to sustain a devotional state from some heightened spiritual experience. And we don't want to do have anything to do with the outside world because that's what feels best for us. We, we might isolate ourselves outside of relationships because relationships have been painful. And so we, we create this sort of nurturing tree space within our minds that in, in actuality is harboring and closing our heart. And so the metaphor for us then is yes, those places have value sheltering in the tree of that of that respite but we are here and we are in this experience to come down from the tree to come down from the tree but here's the thing as we come down from the tree what is being asked of us is to not lose the knowledge or the wisdom of the peace that we tapped into while being in the tree do you see and that's what it means to be in the world so to come into the world of form to, to come into this human existence but not lose the thing that emotes evokes transmits the peace or the harboring of safety that we feel while we're in that sheltered place in other words how do we become a walking breathing energy of devotion how do we become that then that can bring that, not through self-righteousness, not through the sage on the stage, not through a uh, pumped up ego, but through the simple works that we do in helping take care of one another. How do we, how do we navigate walking into the many personal storms that are a part of the human experience and not get caught up in the melodrama of that. That's where, that's where that beautiful energy and that's where the work that we are here to do and in, 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 within our soul and within our human framework, that, that's where all of the divine then gets to be expressed. 
And so, and so, yes, it, it's a beautiful thing to, uh, to take that time, but it's also important that we integrate back into the world. So what does it feel like then to, to come down from the tree? What does it feel like? It's varied. You know, sometimes we aren't we, sometimes we're pretty good at staying on center. And then sometimes that center is completely disrupted. It's a, it's a beautiful disruption. It's a disturbance in our equilibrium. And to say something like a disturbance in our equilibrium sounds kind of ominous and, and awful and the very thing that we would want to avoid. But a disturbance in our equilibrium is actually the, 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 the precedence for growth. I think about nature. I think about um, the garden, the garden that I just planted uh, in, a, in an old box frame from a bed in, in my yard. And then it's sectioned, it's sectioned off and where it was decided to be placed looked like a really, really great choice. And then come to find out that after all of the soil had been there and all of the planting had come, that its position is actually not optimal because there is a tree whose branches are blocking out the morning sun. And, and so what does a plant do in those kinds of situations? Well, inside the plant is this, this thing called uh, phototropism. Phototropism is, is the process by which the plant bends towards the light. And so if you look at the stem on a plant, you can see how it maneuvers and how it leans and it goes towards whatever the light source is. And so I can already see as the seeds are sprouting that certain things are bending a little bit more towards another way in order to get to the light because those tree branches are blocking it off. And so there is a, a, a disturbance in its equilibrium within the seed that is causing it to bend a certain way because it wants to go back to the source of light and that phototropism. Right. So I could look at that and go, all is lost. Or I could look at it and go, okay, it just means that I'm going to get up and I'm going to, I'm going to trim some branches. I'm going to find a way so that the sunlight isn't so necessarily obstructed. It's a small tree. It's not some big humongous thing. So there's a solution there. There's a, there's a remedy there and there's a valuable lesson. So it's just that I'm gonna do a little pruning so that that phototropism can happen unencumbered for the plant. Same thing for us. You know, we have our own spiritual phototropism inside of us. It's the thing that keeps wanting us to bend towards the light. And then there are things that cast shade. There are things that seem to be a barrier towards that. And without us even realizing it, without us even being conscious of it, there's a part of us that keeps leaning, that keeps leaning towards the light and, and wants us, you know, to be able to do that. Um, and so it requires certain things. It, it requires some alterations within lifestyle. It requires some alterations within thought because um, it's like, otherwise I just want to stay up in the tree and I wanna to try to protect what is rather than coming down from the tree and start to do the pruning and the shifting and the clearing in order that that peace that can be felt up in the tree can be felt down here. Did you follow that? So our own spiritual phototropism is, is the, the beauty of the disruption in our equilibrium. The disruption in our equilibrium says there are options of how we can bend to the light. There are options by which we can find the light no matter where we are, no matter where we've been planted, no matter where we have been planted. But the, the, the fallacy is, is that some of us get into these positions and we just go, oh, well, my seed is planted in the shade. That's the best that I can do. And it's not because then that place that places something finite on the infinite nature of that light. And so each of us, each of us has our own unique journey that bends towards the light to find the way in which that can be expressed no matter where we are. And it is the 
disruption in our equilibrium that helps us in that process. Because you see, if we get so comfortable, we get a little self-righteous, don't we? If we get so comfortable, we're like, oh, look what a beautiful bhakti spirit I am. And then life happens and, and shit happens. And all of a sudden we realize that we've been up in the tree and we've been fearful to bring that knowledge and that devotion down and integrate it into life, which is the greatest classroom. That's the curriculum, right? <laughs> I, uh, and I love, I, 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 I love how, if I'm willing that, that, um, that disturbance in my equilibrium comes in, in such precise and beautiful moments. So I moved from Los Angeles to Alabama. Uh, it's been a while, but uh, many years ago, well over a decade ago, and was not planning on starting a center, but it ended up evolving into that. And as I was there, I was asked to come speak at a, a local university. It happened to be a Baptist university, but they were hosting a series on world religions. And I was like, how cool is that? And here I am in Alabama and I'm being asked to come to a Baptist university to speak on metaphysics and how open-minded and how beautiful. And I, I get there and I come prepared with my little pamphlets that I'm gonna hand out. I'm anticipating how much they're going to love the information because, hey, I loved it. And so I'm all excited and geared up to, to recruit. And when it's my turn and I'm in this state-of-the-art classroom where the, where the arena seating goes up like that and I'm kind of down here in the pit and I start to speak, I start talking about things as like cause and effect and the power of the mind. And, and um, one, one young man raises his hand and asks me something, which is a typical question that I think many are challenged with. And it's about how you mean to tell me that this thing that happened to me and my family, that we caused that by our thoughts. And as I began to try to talk about the nuance of that and thought is energy and that it's not personal, he just didn't want to hear it and yelled out heresy, heresy. And you know how it is when someone in the crowd begins to do that, then it kind of catches on, that mob mentality begins. And so all of a the sudden there are people shouting heresy, heresy. And before you know it, I'm in this lion's den with with all of these 19 20 year old people in alabama shouting at me and calling me a heretic and i will never forget that moment it was a profound disturbance <laughs> in my equilibrium and i just stood there and i stood there and something inside of me i want to call it the light inside of me that asked me to lean into it said Stand here and take it. Stand here and listen. Take it. Watch them. Don't take it personally, but take in the experience. And what seemed interminable, maybe it was 45 seconds, I don't know, but I did stand there as they began to shout at me that I was a heretic, and I looked at them. And in that brief moment of time, I remember thinking, you were once them. You were once raised in, in a fundamentalist background that thought a certain way. So you can understand that they're now having their disturbance in their equilibrium. And you're the, you're the thing that's causing that. And you're having a disturbance in your equilibrium because of them. And, 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 and so it was kind of a beautiful thing where I can't speak for them in terms of what their disturbance felt like, but for me, I welcomed it. It was one of the first times I can ever recall that I was conscious of the disturbance, so conscious that I welcomed it. And by the time I left that classroom and I took all of my flyers, my trifolds, hmm, nobody wanted one, and walked back, to my car that by the time I got into my car, I was physically shaking, but I also started to laugh. And, and I don't know if the laughter was 
was from some kind of trauma, but I was fascinated. I was fascinated in the disturbance because what it taught me was, see there, that's what it's like. Can you, can you sustain your connection to your, your experience of God, even in the midst of that, even in the midst of a sort of public stoning? And why I, I think about that story so often and I'll uh, teach that story so often is because of that one element about being conscious in the disruption. And so I noticed that when my equilibrium is wanting to be disrupted, whether it's by uh, someone discounting me or, or a painful experience, that there is a, there's a sort of rush that goes through my body. I can feel it like a heat. And, and sometimes that's, the, that's the, the primordial part that launches the anger. And as I began to get acquainted with that sensation of, ow, that hurts, I, I do my best to, to not try to medicate it, to not walk away from it or not react from it, but to feel it. And so it's happened a couple of times, you know, in various ways. It's interesting because I... Um, I started to, to paint my living room downstairs. And uh, I've made the mistake before of buying a whole gallon of paint and then getting started and then realizing, ugh, this, this, this doesn't work, this color doesn't work, or this is off. So then I'm thinking, ah, you're so wise, David. Now you just buy those little quartz. And, uh, and, and so in buying the little quart, I, I loved the color. And I loved what it looked like. And that quart went kind of a long way. So I thought, let's be crafty and just go get another quart. And maybe perhaps I can finish this one whole section. And so I did. I got the other quart and began to do it again. And then yesterday, as I was trying to finish it up, I would then go back with my second quart and I would touch up places where the first quart was only after the whole thing to realize that they're not matching. <laughs> they're not matching. Uh, this second court seems to be a little bit darker. Um, and all of a sudden I realized, no, you're going to have to go and invest in a whole gallon and start the process all over again. And at first there was that feeling of, ah, oh, I'm so annoyed or wanting to blame the person who mixed the paint. And then I realized, but David, this is this this little minor disruption is a spiritual practice. This is a way in which you can you can uh, allow this time to to go back and look at where perhaps you didn't do such a great job. Or and I noticed there were places where I didn't sand my patching down very much, and I just painted over it. And I thought, no, this is an invitation for you to go back and be more deliberate in the transformation of your walls rather than rather than using this disruption in this tiny example of my equilibrium by being mad and annoyed so it's like no something within me something something within me that's pulling me towards the light and the spiritual phototropism wants me to lean into this process and allow that annoyance to dissolve small example big example this week, I'm on a call, uh, a special Zoom call with a public figure. It's a private, private Zoom call, public figure, someone who's uh, been in the news a lot in the political arena. And we're being invited to come and continue uh, a discussion on how we as, as people of new thought or people in leadership can, can support humanity. And this person says that they're not going to, this isn't about them. They're not going to speak. They just want to hear from us. And when it's the floor is open, I just go, okay, I'll say something. And uh, I just said, what I'm feeling is that uh, like anything, how, how we are with ourselves determines the quality of how we're serving humanity. So for me, what that's looked like is, is disrupting my equilibrium. 
is, is looking at the things that I've identified with, is looking at my shadow of, of wanting to take ownership of all of the ways in which I've perhaps been self-righteous and looked at my bias. Because in that way, as I begin to let those identities die, then I can move into the arena of what people are experiencing or, or labeling as the unbearable. And I can still be in the unbearable, right? I can come down from the tree, but I can bring a, bear to, a bearability to it. I can, I can still maintain the wisdom or whatever the, the, the peace that was obtained in the tree. I can bring it down and that way I can be more effective. And I said, this isn't anything new. This is what we've always been called to do. But I'm just noticing that for me, it's, it's even more heightened than ever to let those identities die within me that perhaps um, want to keep fighting at the effect rather than bringing vision into the systemic issue. And I was smacked down for it. She was like, they were like, no, 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 you can't do da, da, da. And the people who are hurting and da, da, da. And, and I, I really just wasn't heard. And there was that feeling again inside of my stomach, like, oh my God, I'm being called out on this Zoom call by this famous person. And, blah, 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 blah. and I just kind of sat with it. And I thought, isn't this funny? Isn't this funny? You're feeling this again. You're wanting to take it personally. When I got off the call, I let my curiosity go, what was that about? And, and I'll own up to the fact that there was a part of that self-righteousness or that ego of, look at me, I'm being included in this call. And then the shame that I felt by not impressing this person. But I will tell you that my relationship with this person goes back 35 years. And our relationship has always been that way. There's always been a little undercurrent of contentiousness, and I don't know what that's about other than the fact that it's there to teach me something. It's there to continue to disrupt this idea that someone, that I need someone's approval or that someone's status is more effective than mine. And so I continue to allow myself to be teachable and to look at them and, and to not discount them, but to go, you know what? There's less, There's such validity there. And that's what it means to come down and to be in the experience. And so what I want to, to, to share with you again today is how can you lean into the, the disturbances that want to rattle your equilibrium? And rather than preserving the equilibrium, like most of us do when we are unconscious, we want to, we want to preserve our equilibrium we want to preserve look at the people protesting because they they want to go back and they want to get their hair done and their nails done and they want to and uh, 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 because they want to preserve what was in terms of their equilibrium rather than leaning into the disturbance leaning into this this does not mean in any way that we discount the pain that people are experiencing but if you're watching this, if you're called to this type of information, then there's some level of, of, of leadership or consciousness within you that is being called to expand, to keep disrupting, to keep disrupting, to keep disrupting your equilibrium so that you can come down from the tree over and over and over and over again and move into the field of humanity with such effectiveness and, and, and not an effectiveness that oh, I'm better than you, but an effectiveness that actually tangibly lifts people out of the quicksand, lifts them out. It's the Samaritan energy of picking someone up, feeding them, showering them, helping them find stability. And in the doing of that, we find our own greater strength and stability. But that's not going to happen if you and I are trying to preserve our equilibrium by staying up in our metaphoric tree. And so this is the call. This is the call. And everyone is a teacher. You know, it's so funny how 
I want to label this experience as good or bad, or this person is awful and this and that, you know, but it's, it's in that experience of the disturbance of equilibrium that we continue to evolve. I've, I've, I've leaned heavily into this throughout all of last year and, and now into this whole time together with, with canceled surgeries and the, the dissolution of my marriage and all of the things that, that have such pain around them in, in the human experience but are necessary in the disruption of, of, of an equilibrium, perhaps that I didn't even know that I had an allegiance to. So that whatever identities that I'm holding sacred that are getting in the way of the bigger journey can finally be put to rest. And that's not just my journey, that's your journey. That's everyone's journey. So how can we help one another? How can we help one another do this? How can we be reminders? <laughs> How can we stand even when the winds of, of fear shout out heresy and remember our truth? Yes, we do have to go up to the tree to take a breath, but we also have to come down from the tree. And so I'm here. I'm here if you, if you need some support, just um, send me a message. Uh, let me know what that support looks like for you. If you need to talk. Um, yes, I'm learning to ask for help, but I think we all need to learn how to ask for help in whatever way that is. And uh, so for me, if you want to help me, I will post the ways in which you can make a donation if you feel so inclined. And what do you need? What do you need? And I'm, I'm offering that to you. And so uh, once again, I'm privileged to, to be able to, to, to connect with you in this way. I feel so honored. And thank you for tuning in. Uh, share it. And uh, know that you are loved. And until next time. And little little plug. Uh, if you know about Science of Mind magazine, Science of Mind magazine has been around forever. It's a, a international magazine. I got the honor to have written the daily guides for this month, the month of May. And if you're not familiar with the magazine, you can go 